Hello, I'm Randy Barber, and I'd like to welcome you to Let's Talk Education. This is always a chance for you to hear directly from the Boulder Valley School District's team on important topics in our school. And as you might know, October is Bullying Prevention Month. In the Boulder Valley School District, we are committed to ensuring that every student feels safe uh, and supported every day while they're in our school buildings and as they're, as they're learning. But we know as, as Superintendent uh, Rob Anderson spoke to families around our school district uh, when he entered a few years ago, uh, especially with our Spanish speaking families, that this is one of the biggest concerns that they shared. And so today I've, I'm so excited to be able to talk to a great panel, uh, including a couple outstanding counselors from our district uh, and a, a student support member, uh, team member uh, in regards to the, uh, the efforts that we have around uh, bullying prevention. Uh, as well as some improvements that we've made re recently, we're going to talk about some posters that hopefully you're seeing up in your schools, some other things, and, and hopefully the most important thing is that as a community, what, what we can do to prevent bullying moving forward, bullying uh, uh, behaviors moving forward. Uh, so let's go ahead and move uh, and, and, and meet our panel. I'm, I'm excited to introduce uh, Kristen uh, Krohn, uh, who's a counselor at Netherland Elementary. Uh, hi, Kristen. How are you doing? Good. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Are you up in Ned right now? I'm not. I'm <laughs> down in Boulder. <laughs> all right. All right. Uh, just wanted to check for, for whether or not our quality is going to be good throughout the whole thing. I know that they've only got like one fiber line running up there. So I think we're good. Okay. I know that we will have, uh, oh, and Serena Gonzalez is joining us. Uh, she's a counselor at Centaurus. Hey, Serena. Hi. Um, thanks for waiting for me. I've got parent-teacher conferences after this tonight, so I was trying to get home and I just didn't time it right, but um, no, thanks I, for letting me join you tonight. We are so excited that you're joining us. Uh, and the last, last but not least is uh, Mike Lowe. He's uh, the District Bullying Prevention Coordinator. Hey, Mike. How are you, Randy? Thanks for doing this for us. This is great. Absolutely. This is such an important topic. And, and I do want to just mention that if you do have any questions that you'd like to ask to our panel as we go on, as always with Let's Talk, this is a, a forum that we like to bring in parent questions on. Uh, so if you'd like to ask something, uh, just go to uh, bit.ly, that's B-I-T dot L-Y slash Let's Talk BVSD. Uh, and we'll have uh, an opportunity to pull questions from there throughout it. Also, we, we've got uh, little mentions on Facebook and, and Twitter. If that's easier for you to get to, uh, just leave a question there as well. Uh, but we'd love to start with our counselors. Uh, and as Serena was talking about a very busy time, I know you guys are uh, immensely busy, uh, again, parent-teacher conferences and all the other crazy things that you guys have got going on. So thank you for, for taking time out of your busy schedules. Um, I want to I want to say that you know bullying uh, uh, you know I can imagine that bullying can look very different at different levels whether that's from elementary uh, or at a high school level you know what kinds of things do you guys see and hear when you guys are walking around your buildings or, or as students come in and, and counsel with you yeah um, I guess I can start because I'm at elementary and I've actually been in elementary for 14 years now um, as a teacher previously and now a school counselor. So I was kind of looking over the different forms of bullying, and I guess the most the most common that we see at the elementary level would be the physical bullying, which would be like the kicking, hitting, um, and then the verbal, which could be the name calling, the teasing, um, and even spreading rumors, unfortunately. Um, we also, in the last few years, have seen an increase in cyberbullying just with the expansion of um, our online platform. So that's definitely um, something to be aware of. and. Um, However, I am hopeful that the fact that we are like focusing on this and putting protocols in place and um, the policies um, and also teaching explicit skills that hopefully we're going to see a decrease in this behavior um, in years to come. Serena, what, are things a little bit different at the high school level? Yeah, I think things are a little bit different and it's been interesting this year because I think um, we're finding that students are a little bit um, socially behind and so we're seeing some um, different behaviors that would um, maybe be more like middle school behaviors that we're seeing in the high school. Um, we see um, a lot of conflict. So one of the big things that we do at the high school level, at least at Centaurus High School, is we try to tease out what is going on because there's a lot of peer conflict that is not that doesn't fall under necessarily that umbrella of bullying and the district is doing really great things around bullying um, and we can put different um, plans in place for things that are not bullying but are pure conflict. We can do mediations and different things like that. So there's a lot of students that will report bullying, um, but then we do an educational piece around um, what is bullying, what is pure conflict, what um, and and how do we handle those things differently. We do see, unfortunately, quite a um, bit of cyberbullying and um, online. The um, technology is um, very 
available and all through the pandemic um, when we were working with students over the last couple of years, even if they weren't seeing each other in person and having these challenges, they were still having those challenges online. Um, and so I agree, I think a lot of the things we're doing that I'm excited to talk about are trying to be preventative um, and then really looking at each um, situation mm -hmm. on a case-by-case -case basis to see what is the best solution for that. And also that you brought up the idea of, you know, sort of the definition of bullying here, because mm -hmm. I know that um, I've got two little girls, uh, they're still in elementary or I guess uh, K-8, so, you know, one's kind of just now wandering into middle school now at sixth grade. But, you know, I do ha catch them occasionally saying, oh, you know, this kid is bullying me. And we have to kind of have that conversation of, you know, well, okay, tell me a little bit more. Because just using the term, I mean, I, of course, we want kids to identify. We want kids to let us know if something's going on. And, you know, anything that makes them uncomfortable in, in learning definitely is something that we should talk about. But that idea of bullying and, and the things that we built laws around, uh, you know, and, and the things that we're trying to, to really stop, um, they do transcend just a, a, a kind of typical peer interactions that might, you might not like a kid or they might be annoying, right? Yeah. I yes, and there, yeah, there's different solutions for it and different things that we do as a district and each of the different schools for bullying once we actually can identify. And so it's part of it is just educating students mm -hmm. on what, what is annoying, what is conflict, and we need to deal with that too. We want everybody to be able to learn and then really to deal with bullying in a, um, in a different way. Yeah, and I'd also bullying. add on to that educating families and guardians about this as well is important. Um, uh, something I like about the second step bullying prevention curriculum is that the students really learn the meaning of behind bullying and that the, it's different than conflict um, or disagreement because as we know bullying has become somewhat of a buzzword and of course we want to bring that to the forefront of how we support students um, but really learning the difference but of course addressing whatever kind of behavior it is like Serena was talking about. Another thing that Serena mentioned that I think is really good for us to kind of dive into a little further is these guys, these phones, is this technology that students now carry around. And I know pressure, and going back to my kids, started early. I mean, fourth, fifth grade, kids are walking around with these cell phones now, and it doesn't take very long, even within the school apparatus, you know, if they've got uh, chats that they're doing with their classes or whatever, for their little side conversations to maybe go a little offline and, and, and to create maybe some issues that, that, you know, a parent would want to know about or that, that might need to be help, helped with with the teacher. Um, again, this adds a whole complexity, things that we didn't have to worry about, you know, it's 24 seven. And what, what do parents, you know, and, and I'll start with Serena on this one, that, you know, jump balls are a little bit tough on, on, uh, on, on the Google meet, but, uh, Serena, when, when you're talking to, to parents about, or maybe even kids about, you know, the cell phone and, and all this is opened up. I mean, it's really, it's a lot of new stuff that we haven't, that we didn't have to deal with as kids. Right. Yeah. Um, so I, I think it is a big challenge for our families, for sure. I typically don't have students asking for advice around their technology, their cell phones, or apps. I wish they would ask more about <laughs> what, how they could more responsibly use technology. But I do get a lot of um, questions from parents, and then I end up in meetings where I have an opportunity to talk to students about it. Um, for families, I think the number one thing that I've used with my own my own children that know that when they get their own phones and um, go through school and what I recommend for families is that they are really observing what their students are doing on their phones that it, that you can go through if you are on social media that your parents are your friends on social media and are constantly going through um, your feed and checking out what you're doing. Um, I have a lot of parents especially for younger students that um, have like a charging station at night um, because the charging is just as valuable as the device itself. And if it doesn't have a charge, it doesn't work. So, um, so sometimes families will have, because it's not only just the, it can be a distraction in a lot of ways. And so it can um, be unhealthy to have your technology overnight, but that tends to be where dangerous behavior is happening is when it's um, not supervised and um, outside of like school hours and um, overnight, if parents can supervise it more, either through the technology, through the apps where you can really see what your students are doing online um, to make sure that they aren't um, reaching out to somebody inappropriately or being reached out to inappropriately in a bullying sense. Um, that's probably my best piece of advice at the high school level is really to kind of help them to slowly and gradually um, get that independence just like we do with all the other life experiences is that we never want to just have students like 100% have all of the responsibility and independence when it comes to technology and social media. 
um, that we really kind of help them along little baby steps at a time. And you're, and you're so right. I mean, this stuff happens oftentimes, you know, later, uh, you know, when again, parents may not be up. And, and again, it's this idea that you really, you know, in the old days, uh, you could go home and you'd have a, you know, a break from the people at school. And now they're like right there in your bedroom if you got your phone with you, right? So uh, definitely difficult. I, I also want to just say too, um, you know, um, in my experience, uh, I, of course, I'm in communications, but uh, I've talked to some of the folks uh, with law enforcement that deal with the crimes against uh, children side of things. And one of the things that they remind, uh, really set my context for how to approach this. I think oftentimes parents will go, gosh, you know, it's, it really infringes on their privacy or whatever. And the, and the police officer really in a friendly way told me, you know, listen, until those kids are 18, until they're adults, you're training them up and you're responsible for their behavior. So that idea of having, you know, a way to check in and, you know, an understanding when you give them a phone or, you know, those kind of things is, is a key part of this that you need to be continuing to play that role as a parent throughout. Um, Krista, are you seeing this kind of thing at an elementary level starting to seep in at a younger age? Um, I, I do I do think so with our in, intermediate student, students as they're, like you said, getting more independence with technology. And I love Serena's point about a gradual release as families, as guardians. Um, but one thing we are doing is, is training our students to be prepared in case they do witness um, cyberbullying. Um, so one thing they, they know how to do is actually how to report to a trusted adult right away um, and also refuse if they do see this um, bullying happening online, how they can stand up to it. Um, one other thing I would suggest is just making sure as, a, as guardians that you're continuing that open dialogue with your kids um, about what's going on in their life, you know, online, offline, in school, outside of school. And, you know, of course, not shaming or judging, but really providing that, that listening ear and, and um, validating, affirming what they're going through um, and then helping them if they need that support. So we really want to start that in the younger grades. So when they do get to middle and high school and have more access to um, you know, independence and um, especially with technology that they have those skills and they have that trusted adult they can turn to. Perfect. Um, I do want to mention, as I said at the beginning of the show, you know, we actually based on some feedback that we got from our parents, uh, we have uh, CAPL, which is uh, our Spanish speaking parents meet with our leadership on a normal basis. And one of the things that they talked about was really, again, this bullying issue, again, from the Spanish speaking families, it's one of the areas that they really wanted us to focus on. And one of the things that they also did was that they looked at um, some of our schools and, and Columbine was a great example where Col uh, Columbine had a, a form already, uh, a paper form that people could grab from the, from the desk there and fill out. Uh, they had sort of a clear understanding of what was going on. And I think that's part of the, the issue here too with families is that they don't really know once they start the process what it looks like. So I'm gonna have Mike uh, Lowe kind of talk about this a little bit, but I do wanna show uh, one of the things that we did right at the beginning of school is and it's in Spanish and English is uh, a poster that now you should see in your school and it gives you you know a clear uh you know sort of a uh, line of uh, all the things that are supposed to happen uh when you report bullying and then it also has a qr code and a, and a web address uh, for help for students which by the way is accessible on all of our websites including the schools right at the top of the website uh, which by the way i have a broken hand and that's why i'm waving this uh cassie looking thing around sorry uh probably should explain for those that, that don't know but, um, you know, uh, that's an easy way for you to get to this information and all of our resources in regards to bullying prevention, et cetera. But, Mike, this is, this is something that we really, um, we've listened to our parents and have been trying to take action on. Yeah, I think that's some of, you know, we live it and breathe it and talk it all the time. And so we forget sometimes that we may understand how it flows, but we don't always do a great job of letting our, our clients in our community really know how it is. So, Kudos to our parents for really sitting down with us and saying, you know, a lot of times we'll report a behavior and then we hear nothing. So we don't know if there's anything been done for the, the student that maybe started the incident or the student that maybe it impacted. And so um, this has been kind of almost a two year project of not just working through a new policy, but also being really consistent with you know, our state with the bully prevention, um, as well as then being able to be transparent and work with our families, because, you know, we really want um, an incident like this to become a, a learning place for all of our students that are involved in it. And so we really need to do a good job of not just reacting to the behavior, but also moving forward and teaching our kids how to deal with, because we're a community, right? And we're, and we're all in this together. And so 
really working hard to build some support plans to support all of our kids moving forward. So we give them the tools to work through that. And I know you just touched on it, but we have changed some policies in order to, to really fine tune what we're doing, right? Yeah, we, um, um, Kathleen Sullivan, our, our legal counsel has worked really hard with a lot of our policies and really created a specific policy. And I think it's, um, let me put my, I think it's JDHB. It is, that's pretty impressive. Um, JDHB is uh, actually our specific bullying policy. We're really at more just outlines a pretty generic definition of not just bullying, but, and Kristen and Serena did a good, good job talking about this, but also cyber bullying, but also, um, a, kind of a, I guess I would call it a checklist to support our schools. So when um, parents do call or kids do report some behavior, it gives us really some step-by-step -step what to do so that we don't let some things fall through the cracks. So, so everybody involved in it feels supported so we can move past it. Because I think that's the trickiest part, right? Bullying, you know, I know every, there's so many different, you know, finely tuned definitions, but, you know, bullying is, is repetitive, especially after um someone knows that it's hurting the other person it's really repetitive and it comes from a position of that power and so that hurt harm and humiliation kind of thing we really need to be able to wrap through it or it just becomes this vicious cycle and and we know you know i know you're going to touch on it later but it really can impact not just school life but um family life and friend life and so we really want to try to support um you know from our point knowing that it takes all of us to really support our kids and growing and learning how to um, address it, but also maybe not become that student that is bullying. And, and I know we kind of talked a little bit about the idea of like, people may not know exactly what bullying is, quote unquote. Um, and sometimes a parent may, may have a feeling about something. They might, they might notice that their kid's acting a little bit differently or, you know, that kind of thing. So they may not ha right away know that it's a bullying situation. Um, and that's partly, you know, that's why we have a whole system around kids um, that really tries to assess what might be going on. Hopefully we get a report. Um, it may not start as a bullying report, but it may come back to here. Uh, it may not start as, uh, you know, a, a threat, you know, against the school. And yet this whole process is built together so that we can vet that out. Right. Right. I think that's the key is, you know, um, and I think Serena may have mentioned it. It doesn't have to, it doesn't have to fall under the definition of bullying for it to be behaviors that we really want to address and support our students. And so whether it, it's founded or it's unfounded as bullying, it's something that we really want to help address. You know, there's, and I know we're going to talk about uh, some resources that are out there for families, but um, stopbullying.org, I believe it is. Um, I think it's, well, actually it's stopbullying.gov um, does a really good job of talking about just some things that parents can kind of keep an eye on because we see our students that, as this behavior and hurtful behavior can become repetitive, we can see changes in their sleep patterns, changes in their eating, changes in maybe just feeling a little more withdrawn, maybe not hanging with their friends as much, irritable with, I mean, I have a teenager at home, so I know what irritable means, but, you know, sometimes, you know, just those random irritabilities. So just some of the things to look at and then just some really good ways to just have those open-ended conversations about what's going on. So I think that's just such a big part. And sometimes I think as parents, we just, you know, we just let kids sometimes deal with it on their own. I think it's really important for us to really have those tools to just have that little eye on, kind of like we do with teachers and counselors, but also be able to have that conversation with our students or our children when we see that behavior changing. And again, parents are, are one of the best people, their best position. I mean, a teacher is with the student all day long. Parent hopefully is around them in the evening to see these things. When you have a kid, and I, again, I'm thinking about more of the elementary age where they were gung-ho about going to school, you know, yesterday. And then suddenly today, they're like, I don't want to go. You kind of want to check that. Like, what, what's going on there? What's, what's, behind, what's driving that behavior? What's, what's the thought there? So it's important to ask that follow-up question as a parent, right? huge and and once again i mean we're so lucky that we have counselors in not just our secondary but our elementary now but that's a great time to have a, a call in to our counselors before it becomes so big that we're not sure where to be because once again it doesn't have to be bullying for us to really build some supports in for our students so that they feel as comfortable right as they can i mean we're still all dealing with life and there's stressors all out there but if there's some things we can do to support so that those aren't becoming the behaviors that we see, it's so much better. 
I, I do want to ask this question before we, I want to follow that up what you just said with the counselors in a second here. But um, the idea of, you know, so we put out these posters, we've got this process in place. How are things going so far this year, Mike? Um, so I would say, I, I wouldn't call it slow, but I would say it's, it's a brand new process. You know, Columbine and Sanchez and Pioneer had really kind of started this, um, you know, we lovingly call it our bullying button, but a way for parents to be able to actually fill out a form to get it to the school. So I would say that part of it's become, uh, it's coming along, but it's a little slow. I do really appreciate that there's still parents that are willing to pick up the phone and call the APs or the counselors and let them know what's going on. But this just adds that one more step. There's also, if you don't feel comfortable with technology or maybe it's not just readily available for you, you can also go to the schools and actually fill out the form right there. If you don't feel comfortable coming in and sitting down and talking about it, you can fill it out and get it to us. And, you know, we make a, a promise to say within 48 hours, we'll get in touch with you. You know, I, we may not be done with the full investigation. We may not know all of the steps that we're going to do to really support, but we really want to let parents know that we heard you and that we're on it. And then, you know, we, there's always small things we can put in place while we're figuring this out to really support. And I think that's the biggest part because we want parents and kids to know that's, that's our job is we're here to support moving through what, whatever situations are going on. Perfect. I think that's a good segue to go back to the school level. And I mean, when somebody comes forward and they fill out this form or again, maybe they just say something to a teacher, a trusted adult, um, all these things can lead to the same place, right? Um, Chris, at, a, at an elementary level, you know, there's uh, a number of people that could potentially help a student and counselors or elementary counselors are a big part of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we really want to make sure all our staff members are, are um, educated in terms of how to, uh, when a student does report to them, what to do with that report. Um, we always want to, of course, listen, validate, let them know they did the right thing, thank them even, thank you so much, and then hopefully give them an idea of what the plan is. Now I'm going to, you know, let our principal know and we're going to make sure that this stops. Um, and again, just letting the student know that they, they did the right thing, affirming their feelings, um, and also asking what they might need in that situation to feel more comfortable or safe, um, and then taking action. Um, but again, it really does, a big part of this whole program is staff members um, being proactive in supporting students. Um, and I always tell my students, you guys, Sometimes we don't see the bullying. I wish we did all the time or we can read minds, but we don't. So we really need you guys to just report, report, report. Even if you're not sure, come talk to us so we can, can figure out a solution. Um, and I think our students feel as though they're empowered by that, that, you know, if they're able to, you know, come talk to someone, someone's going to get them help. Um, I know that Mike covered a lot of the, uh, the things that parents should be looking for. Anything that you want to add at an elementary level? Yeah, no, Mike did a great job. I was just thinking about that. I think just like, a change in their demeanor, like Mike was saying, like if you're noticing that every time they go to soccer, they throw a fit, um, thinking about different settings and how their behavior might change. Um, and then also the academic achievement piece, if you're really noticing that they're having a hard time with school, that's definitely something to, to investigate and look into, no matter if it's bullying behavior or something else happening to them. Um, but yeah, just the overall, it has your child's mood shifted. Perfect. Uh, Serena, let's go to the secondary level. Uh, again, you know, we'll kind of start with the same question I was asking Kristen, which is just that idea. Of, so, so somebody makes a complaint or staff members notice something wacky going on in the halls or whatever. What does that look like from your perspective? Uh, yeah, um, I think there have been there's been a little bit of a shift this year in um, the um, number of just the, the, the amount and the need for social emotional support, including bullying and just in, in peer conflict in general. Um, and I'm not sure if it's because of the um, the new work that's being done around bullying throughout the district so that we have like more of a succinct kind of plan that I think is more consistent from building to building. So I think that's really good. I have never worked so closely with um, our administrative team as I have this year on issues of bullying. And so I feel like, um, and I think that that makes all of the difference in the world because I think historically throughout my career, and this is my 22nd year at Centaurus High School, um, historically, bullying has been something that kind of lived in the administrative offices, mm. um, which is a difficult thing because it feels very punitive and who's in trouble and who's not in trouble. Um, whereas now we're really partnering, so I'm not sure if it was a shift coming off of um, virtual learning or if it's because of the new district policies and procedures. 
Um, but we are doing tons of mediations and ton, tons of restorative work, um, really stuff that I've quite frankly haven't seen in years where instead of a student necessarily being in trouble, they're maybe doing research about um, the implications of their words. Like um, you called a student this name, I want you to research the history of that name and how it's been used um, throughout our country and our world or whatever the case might be. And so the student writes like a reflective paper, has almost an assignment around it, um, and then is able to genuinely um, come up with a plan with the person that they, they hurt their feelings or they did something to. So um, the mediations have been very effective and have felt more genuine than ever before. And um, as counselors, we're really partnering this year more than I think we've ever done before with our administrative team. Um, and so that, that feels different and, um, and really good. Um, and I think we kind of have a good system with, you know, what do we do when, when this is reported? And I think that it sounds like a pretty good segue to the fact that we have just hired for the district uh, a restorative practices uh, coordinator that's going to be working with schools. I mean, the kinds of things that you're talking about there, you know, incorporating the person that was harmed and the person that did the harm. I mean, that's a key element of that, right? So that everyone's involved in a solution. Yeah, and, and to keep it from happening again, I think if you can truly understand your impact on someone rather than just being sent home or having a consequence that might not feel good and that that could be enough to keep you from doing it again, but to truly understand your impact, I think, um, is like that next level and um, would would be um, more of a deterrent for it happening again, And which is really what we want, is not just to resolve conflicts. We really want people to grow and learn and to keep it from happening again in the future. In my experience, I feel like parents play a pretty uh, large role in, in the bullying situations. Uh, you know, as they intervene, oftentimes it, it and I don't mean this in a bad way, but parents oftentimes become part of the situation. And sometimes that might be a part of a, you know, a, a problem at a time. And I guess what I'm trying to get at here is this idea of parents should play a role uh, in, in, especially at an elementary level, I can imagine that's especially important. I mean, at a high school level, you're getting them closer and closer to being adults here. But I guess what I'm, uh, the, the question that I'm coming up with is this idea of like, we, again, we were raised in sort of a different, in a different environment, you know, which, you know, hazing, was sort of kind of a typical thing when you joined a sports team or, you know, when, uh, you know, when you were going around school, you know, the idea of like, oh, yeah, sure, you know, uh, kids are, you know, not always nice. And, you know, that that can happen where you can, you know, get tripped during sports practice or, you know, whatever in gym and it's a big embarrassing thing. But it, like really the environment has changed greatly from there. Do you, do you sometimes see adults kind of saying, well, I mean, it's not that big of a deal because that was what they grew up in and maybe they don't know that the that there's been kind of a sea change there or I mean, what's what's been your, I'll start with Serena on that question. Yeah, I, I do see that a lot. Um, a, a lot of times parents will say like, when I was in high school and, I'm, and I, um, yeah, when I was in high school, things were quite different. It, um, it, was a, it was a totally different world. One of the biggest things that I've seen um, a complete shift from my own experiences through school is um, at Centaurus High School, we really work throughout um, the years we've worked with our C-Squad students, which, which is the BDSD 360. Um, this year, we're specifically doing it with our student council, where we work to find those most influential leaders in our, on our campus um, to help mentor other students. Um, because they want to do it, it's the cool thing to do, and then, um, then you end up um, having this sea change where um, these very influential, really cool kids that are like what we're used to, because uh, that, that part hasn't changed. Like kids haven't changed since we were all in school. Um, but if you can get um, the great leaders to be doing things that are positive instead of feeling like you need to do, because they want, they want to, to be doing good stuff and get noticed. Um, and so we try to really harness that energy and give them a, an avenue to do that um, in a positive way. Um, this year, one thing that we've done that's different with our student council is uh, we have a huge student council this year that um, can't even fit in a classroom. We're hosting it in our student center at, because there's over 50 students that signed up for student council. Um, and we recognize that our new students are some of our most vulnerable students to bullying uh, as well as other things that are just um, transient. And we also host a newcomers program. So I'm glad, Randy, that you brought up some of the Spanish speaking um, families and their unique unique needs, but also not unique needs. They're, they're um, high school students like non-Spanish speaking families. And so um, 
we have a group within our student council group that is working specifically with new students. And so they are kind of mentoring them and working with them, um, gave them a, like a ticket to the homecoming football game and kind of corralled them and they all went to the football game together. Um, we're also having them like go as groups into different school activities, which is great because it gets them involved and hopefully gets them immediately connected. They're doing tours and stuff like that. But the byproduct of that also is that these really strong leaders and cool kids on campus are developing empathy and understanding for other people's challenges. And so it just it just works for everybody. Um, and that's something that we also do through C-Squad and other programs is, is really trying to harness that energy and build empathy so that um, around the school, it's, it's known to be, it's cool to be kind. It's like, these are, these are some of our really most awesome students and they're taking new students to the football game and tailgating with them in the parking lot and that kind of thing. So um, those are some of the ideas that we're doing to try to be proactive and to show, show what it means to, um, that you don't, you don't have to do that bullying and our strongest students are, are doing good stuff. I love that. It's cool to be kind, which mm -hmm. really does kind of refute the whole popular culture aspect of mean girls and all these different things that you see out there that, you know, being catty and, you know, all these underhanded things really aren't, aren't the way that we should be going. And I, I also love what you said, you know, Spanish speakers, oftentimes our most at-risk students are, you know, LGBTQ or, or you know, uh, students of color are really the ones that face the, the largest threat here um, in, in many different ways. We've got to put our arms around them, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we've found all of those um, groups of students um, tend to be especially vulnerable as they're new. And right now coming off the pandemic, if you're a new student, like you've transferred, you're a brand new junior, you don't know anybody because you were virtual last year. Um, it's just really hard to, to come in and you're just more, more vulnerable to bullying and stuff like that. So we do, I do think personally and um, at school I, um, that it's cool to be kind. And if you give students an avenue and like a job, like you're going to help the, they'll, they'll take it and run with it. Um, like most students want to do the right thing and they want to be recognized for being cool. And so if we can just frame it in a way like this is what's cool at our school. Um, so we try to do that in a proactive way. Um, but of course, we also have to do a lot of reactive work too, because it's it's not a perfect system. Of course, I, I gotta imagine that it's cool to be kind in Ned too, right? <laughs> it's super cool to be kind in Ned. <laughs> Even cooler. Um, no, Serena, thanks for sharing all that. It's such great work you're doing at your school. Um, I think what I've noticed is one of the greatest impacts is teaching our students these social, emotional, and bullying prevention skills, and they end up bringing these these skills home and teach their families. I can't tell you how many students I've had say, I, I learned about this coping strategy and I actually shared it with my dad because I can tell he was getting really angry. And so we practiced it together um, because I think the generation that we all came from didn't necessarily talk about these things. We were kind of told to just, you know, buck up and get out there again and, you know, brush yourself off. But these students are really learning that it's so important that we tune in and, and, and think about our feelings um, so then we can support those around us. Um, another aspect that I think has been super powerful this year is just communication with families in the cases of conflict um, or even bullying behavior that we've been able to really address those with families and keep them in the loop to let them know how we're, how we're supporting the students and then also providing resources for them to use at home. Um, so I think that's been a huge impact on, on kind of shifting how we think about bullying behavior. But you also have the extreme of, oh my gosh, you know, the freaking out, which is understandable when you're when your, your child is, is feeling this way about negative behavior. And um, I think though, again, coming back to the communication and talking through these things and talk about how we're addressing them is really helpful. Um, and being very, you know, being proactive is just right when we hear about anything um, up at NED, uh, my principal and I, we will uh, consult and then uh, formulate a plan to address it immediately. And I think that's been really helpful as well. Yeah, it's important for, I mean, again, parents can play such an important role of advocacy um, and, and we want them to do that. Um, and yet it's, it's important to, 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 to play the right role where we also can let the, the kids move, move forward, you know, as we're getting these, you know, these efforts together, like restorative practice again, great, great, great example of that where the kids can help come up with the solutions and all feel good about it. Um, but, but they got to play the right role in that to make that all work. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know that there's a question there necessarily, but um, I guess, you know, I, I do want to circle back with you also and just when, when you do when you do have a, a situation that comes up, um, how, what do you want kids and, and parents to do? So, 
you know, I know that there's been a lot of conversation about kids taking action right there at the moment being, I think, what we call an upstander. Is that, is that right? Um, and that, that could be really key, but not every kid feels that bold. Um, and I mean, obviously, the, the, they're worried about repercussions as well, I'm sure. Um, what, what message do you want them to know, and I guess uh, also for elementary parents? So a part of our second step program is um, we have the three R's poster, recognize, is it bullying behavior, reporting, and refusing. And we really ask students they always report no matter what. If they feel like they want to take the third step of refusing, which means saying, hey, using an iMessage or saying, please stop in an assertive tone, um, they're welcome to do that. But by no means do we, do we ever force them to take this step. Um, we do say, you know, it could be helpful if you report or refuse with another upstander, like you're talking about, a friend, an ally. Um, but again, we really direct them that report to someone and we can help you as an adult. Um, and so in those moments when they're not quite sure what to do, they can go to the recess para, they can go to me or our principal or the classroom teacher and get help immediately. Um, but they also have the option because we want them to also advocate for themselves and learn those skills because they're going to have to learn, use those later of how we can really stand up for ourselves and for our friends by being those awesome allies and bystanders. Serena, I don't know that you guys use the same posters in the school, but I'm imagining that the, the, the conversation is similar. Yeah, it's very similar. That is a cool poster. Um, it <laughs> might not have the same effect at the high school level, but it's really the same idea, and um, which is why it's great. They are getting that message. Um, from elementary all the way through the district, um, through the high school level, um, that our big thing is we want them to report. Uh, yes, I agree, Randy, that it would be great. Up, the upstander thing is it's a special skill and a special student that can really take that social risk and be vulnerable to say, like, that's, that's not cool, that's not okay, but that's really asking a lot of, of a young person in high school to, to do. Um, and so what we really expect students and um, train them on and talk to them about is, is reporting. That's the, the number one thing. Um, we've worked really hard at Centaurus High School to, and across the district to um, make sure that we put in place um, systems where there's a trusted adult. Um, and so as we continue to get bigger and bigger, um, it might not be the counselor, it might not be an administrator. Um, we have an advisory program where we're really hoping that um, through this like, small group where students go through high school with um, a group and their teacher, that they at least can have a trusted adult because that increases um, a lot of the positives and decreases the negatives. Um, and so through our advisory program and our Warrior TV, which is where we put our announcements and stuff, we will put messages about, about that exact thing where students will report to a trusted adult. And sometimes it's their advisory teacher, sometimes it's someone else. Um, but it's hard as we keep getting bigger, uh, but that reporting piece is huge so that we can advocate for students um, and um, as much as possible when it's safe to and we can, we can keep students confidential as long as they're not directly involved in it. Um, and that a lot of times makes them feel more comfortable. And when it's possible to do that, we ensure and we work hard to do that because we want them to always feel comfortable to do that. And so it's a little bit, you have to kind of be careful about that, right? Depending on what it is, you have to report forward if it's an adult and yeah, uh, yeah. Of abuse that might be there and all that kind of thing. But yes, we never guarantee it. But in a case of bullying, if somebody's reporting something that they saw, we can typically keep the person reporting confidential, um, especially if that and we want to make make sure students and families know that um, so that it's safe to report it. Um, as long as everybody involved is safe, um, then we can keep that piece confidential. Now, I know, Mike, uh, that there is uh, safe to tell, which is a, an anonymous uh, system that you know, hypothetically, if for some reason you don't feel comfortable and you need to stay anonymous, um, there is a there's a way to report that way as well, right? Yeah, you can do it through the Safe to Tell organization, and that does go um, to the actual school of of the report and also to the law enforcement as well. But it is so important. I think everything that Serena was just saying is is key. If we can have relationships, I mean, relationships are the key of everything here. You know, if you've got somebody that you can trust and talk to, um, you know, that ability for us to know who's making the report so that it's, you know, you can ascertain credibility right away. Oftentimes when we're dealing with things that are you know, handed to us anonymously, we get the information, but it could be a little bit harder over the long term to kind of, or in this effort to try to investigate it, to try to determine what's what. Um, so, you know, and again, that, that ability to, to immediately be able to support somebody if, if they're telling us that something bad's happened too. Right. I mean, all, all that's important to this picture. Well, I appreciate that 
Kristen and Serena really talked about because being an upstander isn't always stepping in between the two, right? And putting yourself in physical harm. It can be that making a report. It can be that, you know, just deflecting the situation or walking somebody away. And, and once again, that whole reporting thing, you know, I know as, as an ex um, principal at elementary, you know, that whole difference between tattling and telling, and it's not tattling when somebody's being hurt either physically or verbally or emotionally, that's you taking being a, an upstanding citizen, right. And getting some, some help from the adults. That's why we're all there. So I just appreciate that. And, and it's just so good to hear. I forget how amazing our counselors are and just listening to the proactive because right there's still there's always that natural consequence but it's that then what how do we really move forward and and i think i think our kids are in pretty good hands with the people that we have at least sitting right here and so <laughs> I, just, I really appreciate it it's just nice to hear it because sometimes you feel a little helpless and you feel like it's an eternal cycle and now finally we are looking at not just the proactive but then what do we do next to support them as we move forward to give them the skills I know Serena wants to add something, and so I'm going to give her that chance. But before I do, I want to add on to what you're saying, which is, um, you know, our counselors are outstanding. And, you know, I, this school district was able to add some additional ad uh, elementary counselors a couple of years ago, and I think that's been key to this whole picture. But the, the role that they play with our kids is key. I know that it takes a whole network of folks to do this, or mental health advocates, et cetera, um, uh, attendance uh, coordinators. I can't remember what their, their title is, Mike. For the attendance advocate and engagement yeah. specialist? We've got this whole network of folks that support kids, and I just want to make sure we give them a shout out. But the counselors, uh, and you know, especially to take their time out of talking uh, today, and, and I just want to say also, this year, holy cow, like, I, I know that we've kind of just slipped in little mentions of it, but this year has been different than any other before. You know, uh, we, we're not done with the pandemic. It still kind of is here, and um, the kids definitely, the impacts of that isolation and I, I we can't put our finger on every last part of, uh, you know, of the, of what's going on there, but we know that whether it's at an elementary level and they, they just are, you know, are not used to that classroom uh, protocol of, you know, if I need to go to the bathroom, I need to raise my hand or whatever. And then like you were saying that Serena at, at a high school level, uh, some of the behavior that we're seeing, we know that, uh, you know, kids are definitely uh, in need and, and are showing that in different ways at this point. And so th I just want to say, deeply from the bottom of our hearts from the leadership team. Thank you for what you guys are doing. And now I want to give you that opportunity to add in there, Serena. Well, I just wanted to add in one piece that um, was from our last piece of the conversation on the importance of that building that trusted adult relationship, however we can do it. And I think our schools are working really hard to do that. Um, and the anonymous reporting works really well and it saves lives. There's just no doubt about it. Um, and it saves situations where there's bullying and, and all sorts of things. It's really hard. Um, and the reason I love to see the increase in trusted adults is because it can be hard to be a witness to bullying. It can be hard to be that upstander. And if they are anonymously reporting it, we don't have a chance. Um, it was just that only other piece that we're missing. We don't have a chance to follow up with that kid who maybe witnessed something really hard or overheard something um, or who might be struggling through that situation. And so um, as, a, as a parent, any parents I would recommend really encouraging if you do have a student that witnessed something or wants to report an instance of bullying to try to do it with a tr trusted adult so you can get the follow-up and help because that can also be a really difficult um, part. Sometimes that third person that was maybe the witness is um, overlooked in the follow-up situation um, and especially if it's an anonymous um, reporting situation we don't know who that is and they don't get the follow-up that they might need. It is so interesting that we, that we expect that our uh, kids do things differently than we do as adults. And yet, when you look about adults, it's, I mean, we, I think we all admire people that are, have that ability to stand up to somebody that needs to be stood up to, right? Uh, you know, that calls in when they see something violent happening in their community or whatever. And yet, I know a lot of adults don't feel comfortable. And, and, and so we're asking, you know, kids something different than ourselves. I think it's important for all of us to, to take those actions when we can. But Again, there's great systems in place if, uh, if you're not that person that, that feels really ready to go stand up and, and face somebody head on. So thank you for that. I do want to get into what, you know, the, the, the resources that are available. And, and a key part of that really are the programs that we have in our schools. I know that uh, Sources of Strength always comes up in, the, in these conversations. I mean, these programs are there really educating students, supporting them. Um, who's willing to kind of talk about, maybe we go by level, is that a good way to go about this? Why don't I start with Kristen in regards to what, what you see in elementary supporting kids and things that are available to parents? 
Yeah, well, we've been really lucky this year to do a full rollout um, of the Second Step Bullying Prevention Curriculum. Um, we started it at NED last year, and so this is our second year, so I can speak a little more to that, I think, because I am now finally feeling more, you know, a lot more comfortable with it. Um, but basically, it's four lessons um, that the counselors lead, about 30 minutes each, um, and it's kindergarten through fifth grade. And we typically do it at the beginning of the year to give kids the skills to, to use throughout the year. Um, during those lessons, we talk about, you know, the three R's, which the poster I showed you about recognizing, reporting, and refusing. Um, we talk about the difference between bullying and a conflict, um, how to refuse bullying, um, and also a, a big chunk is about the bystanders and the bystander power um, and really helping bystanders take the steps needed to support if bullying behavior is happening. And we talk a lot about, hey, you're probably going to have conflicted feelings as a bystander. That's totally normal. And we don't expect you to like make this, you know, grand gesture of like, hey, hey. but what you can do is just be kind, respectful, be inclusive, um, perhaps go report with that person being bullied. Um, and if you do feel as you, if you can, you can also refuse that bullying and let that person know that what they're doing is not okay. Um, we also talk about like, uh, in fourth and fifth grade, we go into cyberbullying and ways to uh, report and refuse if that's happening. Um, and I, the one thing I really like about these lessons is um, empathy is really woven throughout to really tuning into how the person being bullied is feeling and also perhaps if you're the bystander, how you might be feeling. Um, and so I think the kids kids really like them, really fun, engaging videos, lots of skills practice. They like are such good actors up there and, you know, really real life scenarios. And the kids are like, that happened to me or, oh my gosh. And they, you know, after, after like a scenario or a video, they applaud, they get so into it. They actually ask me to play videos over and over again. Um, so again, highly engaging. Um, and then also we have these awesome home links that, the kids bring home in their Friday folders so parents can then support at home uh, with the integration of those skills that they, that they learned and then maybe some education at home as well. Um, and then there's also with this with this program, there's an awesome online staff training component um, in order to really train staff on what to do if you if uh, bullying is reported because as we know, staff members and adults play a huge part in decreasing the number of incidents. So super, super, um, excited about these programs. I feel like we finally have tools to, to support our students and already I, I'm really seeing some um, just kids really getting excited about this stuff and I haven't seen like kids, you know, overly like reporting or anything like that. Of course we want them to report, but what, what I do feel like is they're, they're more empowered and confident and supporting each other as well. So really, um, really excited about what's to come. So important that informed and and uh, and ready to to take action if needed. I think is so such a key to this. Uh, Serena, we want to talk about what uh, looks like at secondary level. Yeah, and I would love to start by talking about sources of strength. Um, it's a really great program. Um, kind of different than at the elementary level. We don't have a prescribed program that we're currently using. Uh, we have in the past, but right now we're not. But sources of strength is a really great program that um, they haven't been able to do the in-person training that they were doing pre-pandemic, um, which also relates to them not being able to go, get out into the classrooms and really work with other students. But Sources of Strength really works as a program where students identify what is their strength rather than working from a deficit. So what are they, what are they great at? What do they bring? Um, and then they all work together and they can do trainings for students um, in our health classes and other classes in our advisory classes. Um, and so Sources of Strength is great, and they're just getting back into the groove of um, how do you be back in person. Um, so they've taken um, the last year and a half off. Um, and then I think um, our advisory program is the other place where we will put um, different lessons in where we can talk about these topics. But at the high school level, as soon as you bring up the word bullying, we see a little bit of a shutdown. So we have to kind of like... Um, not hide it, but we have to like put it in there using different words. So we might talk about your digital footprint as like an advisory lesson. Um, talk to the teachers and teachers um, can get a little bit of training on how you're going to present this lesson. So you can talk about like what is your digital footprint um, and really we're weaving in there a lot of ideas about um, cyberbullying and how to be a responsible digital citizen, um, but not calling it cyberbullying it cyberbullying because high school students will be like, oh, we're talking about bullying again. Um, and so we try not to overuse the word, but still talk about the topics and then also um, have it being presented by hopefully one of those um, 
people that are one of their trusted adults. This year, um, coming off of the pandemic, our teachers have really asked for advisory to be more academically focused. So we're not able to do all of those different lessons that we maybe were doing years ago, where like every other week is um, tutor time where students can go get um, connections with their teachers academically. Um, so it's changed a little bit, but that's, those are, that's usually where we would infuse our curriculum um, as counselors, our curriculum anyways, and anything that deals with bullying or behavior, stuff like that. Perfect. Yeah, you've got to definitely take a different approach. And I, 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 want, I, do, I, I do wonder about that, you know, the idea that it's been so integrated into the media, and, you know, that, that, you know, that shall not bully. And so I'm sure that that impacts, you know, I, again, that shutdown that you end up having with students to a certain extent is probably a little over amplification of that, that term, but it's so important that they hear those messages for sure. Yeah, yeah, they still need to know it. And even if, if they shut down a little because they don't directly relate to it, they don't think they're impacted by it, but we, we can still talk about the topics without using those words and it still can resonate with them all. They can all relate to it. They've seen it, experienced it, for yeah. sure. Uh, Mike, what, what else are we not thinking of in terms of re resources that, that you would want to share? Um, first of all, I did remember somebody else. I know you tried to trigger me, but our mental health advocates are that other group of people that are in our buildings that um, are fantastic resources. So thank you for, it just took a while with my old brain, <laughs> Randy, to get that thing going. So um, I really would love to share, I, I know I could share tons and tons of resources and tons of little pages and, and um, I know Randy and communications is helping me with our kind of social media to kind of getting some resources out through social media for this month, but hopefully ongoing. But there's really three websites that not only our Colorado Department of Education, but Boulder Valley really uses um, besides our second step and sources of strength. But um, one of them is cyberbullying.org. Um, the other is stopbullying.gov. And then another one that really is big in the national bullying prevention is PACER, P A C E R dot org. And, you know, kind of along with PACER, um, October 20th is what we call Unity Day during Bullying Prevention Month. And we kind of um, ask kids if they can wear orange. It's just kind of like a show of unity to have it be a better, more inclusive world. And so it kind of, it hand in hand, right with our bullying prevention and PACER really um, does a great job of trying to make that be national. And um, just wanted to put that out there for everybody. I know a lot of our schools are doing it, but you know, we can do it individually. So wear that orange and get on some of those sites. There's fantastic resources for kids and for parents and obviously for our schools and our teachers. So what, what date was that again that we're all supposed to wear orange? October 20th, which is, I believe, next Wednesday. Okay, so let's make sure we all do that. We'll, we'll definitely put that on social media as well. Um, and I do want to mention that on our website, you know, as we, as we were talking about before, I'm just going to try to share my screen real quick here. Um, you know, on our, on our website, we've got a number of resources. On the front page, again, if you go to this Help for Students, it's right in that, that banner at the top, and all our school pages have that same banner. Um, so then if you click on that, it will actually take you to a page, and there's great resources in here. We've really worked hard to make sure that bullying's in there. If you have a situation that's about a harassment or a sexual assault or something like that, um, you know, we, we hate for that to happen, but we want to make sure that people know that there is a way to report those here. Safe to tell that we were talking about. All those are in there. And we've actually got a great, great listing of all these different resources that you can actually pull up by different, by different needs. So if you've got, you want to look up bullying, here's some resources, uh, including a helpline, Colorado Crisis Services that you can call. Additionally, um, as we were kind of talking about, um, the district has a lot of resources that we've pulled together. There's actually a bullying prevention page that is, is part of that. And so you can see the warning signs, how to report bullying, all the different policies are listed in there. And so we definitely encourage you to go and, and, and go onto that page. Um, you know, some great information that uh, we definitely want to share with you. And the final thing I'll do is I'm just going to go around Robin for any last thoughts that, that our panel has to share with us today. And I'll go in reverse order if that's okay. Mike, why don't I have you start? Uh, anything that you'd want to share? You know, I just, I guess I would say um, thank you to our parents that kind of kept bringing it up to us and really trying to be partners with the district as opposed to pointing fingers and saying, hey, this is what we feel is missing. This is what we don't understand. How can we make this more transparent? Because it really has helped us move forward into j not just dealing with the um, 
student that may have caused the harm, but really looking at it as a global thing and how do we really start repairing um, behaviors. And then thank you for mentioning our new restorative practices coordinator, because I think that just fits hand in hand perfectly with everything going on. I've already told you, but um, just the people with their boots on the ground in our classrooms with our counselors and our admin and our mental health advocates and everybody just taking care of our kids. And please, parents, feel free to give us a call. You can call me. You can email me. Get a hold of your counselors. They're fantastic resources. And call us early. Um, don't wait. Mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, again, just what an amazing group of people in our schools that are here to help you. Uh, again, great coordinators. And uh, we've got a new Title IX person that's come on, uh, on board. We can't wait to see where they take these efforts to just make sure students are supported. But really, it all begins. Uh, and, and really ends with our schools, the things that our counselors and, and, and all the folks that we were talking about, our teachers, uh, that, are, that they're doing is, is key. Um, Kristen, why don't we have you go next? I would say I would just echo what Mike's saying is please reach out um, to the, the guardians. Please reach out to us. Um, that's why we're here to support questions, concerns. Even if you're not quite sure, um, I'd rather have a pulse on it so I can support the student in school and provide you resources. Um, that's why we're here. That's why we're getting paid the big bucks. Um, and also, I'm just really impressed by this generation of students. I have so much hope that they are learning this, the tools, the skills to, to hopefully uh, decrease bullying. And maybe one day we won't even have to have this discussion anymore. But um, thank you for supporting our students at home and um, keep listening to them. Excellent. Thank you. Serena. Well, I think it's all been summed up pretty well. I couldn't agree more that it's a team effort. It's really something that we've all got to work on together, so we need um, parents um, it sounds like parents were really integral pieces of getting this new policy and practice into place and we'll need continued help from parents partnering with us um, to help make sure it's working. Um, and so that's great. And um, just to continue to support students, we need, our goal is for students to learn. Of course, we have lots of pieces around that um, where we're helping students grow and become independent and get ready for um, the world after school. But ultimately we need to teach students and we can't teach students if they don't feel safe. Um, their brains just don't work that way. And so we need to do whatever we can do. So reach out, let us know how we can help because we want them to learn and we need them to be safe in order to do that. That is why we are here, Boulder Valley. We want to make sure that our students can learn and that's key, but they have to be safe. We want to make sure they're surrounded with those supports. Um, thank you for, for joining us uh, to all of our panel members. Uh, your expertise and your knowledge is just outstanding. Thank you for taking the time. I know, again, busy with parent-teacher conferences and all those things uh, with a crazy, crazy start to the year. Thank you. Um, I also just want to uh, go back and, and reiterate what Mike said. Uh, muchas gracias to our, our Spanish-speaking parents that really were very, uh, very helpful in this process, uh, really uh, were advocating for kids, and, and, and we heard you. And we'll continue to hear you. Thank you so much for the effort that you have led in, in terms of bringing this to our attention and, and helping us to get these uh, things in place. Um, thank you to all of you that tuned in today. Uh, this is such an important topic, and we uh, very greatly appreciate your time that you've given us. We hope that you have a great day. Thanks for watching Let's Talk Education. <laughs>